Although I feel like you missed out on some good banter right now. I've been recording. Oh, have you? Oh, oh but I wasn't by the mic. Yeah, you were you were serious by it. You were serious about that. I'll have a yeah. <laughs> I didn't think you were serious about that. <laughs> There's your outtake, Daryl. Hi, I'm Daryl Wanzer Serrano. I'm Ariana Ruiz. I'm Renee Rocha. And this is Imagining Latino Dados. Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, for another episode of Imagining Latinidades. Um, it is uh, cur- it is just now starting to be November, um, and it really feels like it, I think, to everyone. So uh, you're joined today by me, Daryl Wanza Serrano, as well as the rest of our co-hosts. Ariana Ruiz. And Renee Rocha. Yeah, we're all here together. Excellent. We don't have to play any sad music or anything. Yeah, no. Uh, no sad what is trombone. it? Sad trombone. Yeah, we need a happy trombone. <laughs> exactly. What's our happy music, Daryl? Um, I don't know. I don't know if we have any happy music. I think that says something about like our psychological state. Is that we only have sad, sad trombone? Music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in the days of the neoliberal university, Renee. <laughs> uh, trigger warning. <laughs> right. <laughs> Can I handle? Can you explain that to people? <laughs> Neoliberal is my trigger word. My- my mind explodes. So this is like, uh, you know, yeah, it's uh, currently today. It's November 1st that we're recording. This episode will air in a few days, whatever Tuesday is. Um, and we're going to be previewing our upcoming symposium on uh, citizenship and national belonging, uh, which we have some great speakers coming in that we can't wait to talk about. Uh, but to start things off, like this is, I think, the time in the in the year for most of our listeners who, for the most part, I think, are academics when like things are just really like tough. Like it's it's the time when we're like, I think, really needing some kind of a break from the grading. And well, at this point in Iowa, the weather, since we got our first like real snow just in time for Halloween, which was super awesome to have to like shovel sidewalks and stuff in order for little kids to not, you know, hurt themselves while trick or treating. I think as people that have been working on lots of programming this semester as well, um, we've just kind of been been feeling a little tired. Yeah. It, I, earlier we we're talking about the fact that it's week 10. So week 10 on top of already snow on top of just lots of things happening. We survived October. I feel like October was, was really trying to get me down with lots of deadlines and things that had to happen. So now I'm just like, all right, break. When is the break? <laughs> and yeah, so just call it quits. Yeah. <laughs> give, give everyone right. an A and, you know, like, all right, podcast over. Thanks for listening, yeah. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I often wonder if like, if, if there are some people out there, I'm sure, I'm sure there are some people out there who like at this point in the semester do just that and say, ah, oh, forget it. Everyone gets an A. Go it's do. just hard because the semester we'd, you know, next in the spring, we have that spring break, like middle of semester. It feels like, okay, we can get away with a little bit, but this time it just comes so late, so late. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, we do get the full week off for Thanksgiving coming up, but yeah, it's, it does seem late. It's like, when you come back, it's like two weeks and bloop. It's yeah. like something in the middle of October. If only there was such a thing as fall break, that yeah. like half the other universities and or colleges just, around the country. We can just hate on all our friends who have a quarter system. Oh, that's true. Are they like done by now? Oh, they're done by now. Oh no. Cause they started later. Well, one quarter is probably done in like mid November, right? I don't know. I think, so. they, yeah. I think so. That's, yeah. that's quarter system math. I don't understand. That's, yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. <gasps> Moving from quarter to semester, Santa Cruz quarter system. It was, I was hard. I was like, why is this thing why not would they done? Do that? Why would they do yeah. that? Yeah. Why yeah. would they do that? Well, we can be one of those weird colleges that like only teach one class at a time. That'd be amazing. And then you teach like one class for like three weeks or something. Wait, oh. what? Oh, yeah, it's like really? a thing. Yeah, like Cornell up in Mount Vernon does it. A couple of other places do it. What do you mean teach one class for three weeks? You teach like one class. You meet like every day for three weeks. And you're you're like your students are only taking one class, right? Oh. And it's, so it's like super intense. But then like, you know, you're only doing that. I mean, I don't know what their loads are. But like, huh. you know, if your load's like a 2-2 two, two or a 3-3, or three, three, then you're doing that for, you know, whatever, four to six, three-week blocks. Huh. 
I have never it's really heard intense of that. during yeah. that period, right? Because you're meeting for multiple hours a day. Yeah, yeah. You know, every day. So I've done that in Maymaster here um, when tender tracks faculty were allowed yeah. to teach summer courses. Yeah. Um, which That's were basically what that not is. anymore. Maymaster is. Yeah. So it's ah. basically like, I mean, I, I call it Maymaster as a holdover from, I don't know, from when I was younger. I don't think they actually call it Maymaster. And it's really like, it's two weeks in May and two weeks in June. So. Why call it a May master just because it starts in May, I guess. But yeah, it's like that, that would meet Monday through Thursday for like a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Um, And like for some classes, I imagine that's just really kind of miserable. I really liked it for the class that I, that I did it, I think two summers in a row of a kind of like a senior capstone course on like rhetorics of race and racism. Um, and it was, I, I liked it a lot because it allowed for that immersive experience. Yeah. Right. And so people, it was the only thing they were doing for the most part, a couple of them had like, like some other like online classes or whatever they were, they were somehow to taking, which I don't think you're supposed to when you're enrolled in a Maymaster course. Um, but yeah, I mean, it meant that they could really like get into the material and there was, you know, because it was only the gap, the only gaps were weekend gaps it was really an ongoing conversation, and um, I think it was—I think it, it 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 enabled a kind of pedagogy that you don't normally have in a semester. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the reason we feel so tired is because we're trying to do so many things at the same time. It's like I half joked with my DO one time that like my dream was to teach a four zero, mm. right? Like oh, you yeah. know, I just want to go like all in one semester, and I'll just focus exclusively on that. But then give me the other semester to focus on my other stuff instead of trying to do both simultaneously and not doing either very successfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Finger snaps for that. Yeah. 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 I feel like I know people on the quarter system who are kind of able to do that where they like basically, you know, will teach two to zero or something like that um, to be able to get that that quarter to just focus on their research. Oh. I think that's what's been and, and that's where I kind of turned to, to both of you as well, because just trying to figure out time management between the demands of being in the classroom, but also research, but also doing committee work for the department and, and doing things outside of that, like. Whew. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> You're trying to figure out time management from me and <laughs> What not to do. As they say in Texas, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know that I don't know that I'm the poster. Yeah, I'm definitely the poster child of what not to do. No. I think, you know, you, all of you <laughs> Oh, you give me so I've much learned, credit. No, I've I've learned lots of different things that you all are doing outside of imagining Latinidades. And so thinking about how that gets done, like it gets done, right? So one way or another, it gets done. <laughs> so I think there's something to be said for that, right? Like how you all make that happen. Our listeners cannot see the crazed look in my eyes and <laughs> yes, absorbing my hatred of meetings. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. You could do what the, emails to respond to. What emails to respond? <laughs> hey, I'm, down, I'm looking at my laptop right now. I'm, oh, down, no. to, I'm down to 432. Oh my god! I'm Renee. down to 432. That's good. See? Yeah. This like this. don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, my email inbox. I, I I I got I got back to inbox zero earlier this semester, and I was so it it, it was just a a. a huge weight off my shoulders and then like and then i think i think that was right i think that was before our opening conference and then like everything just went to hell yeah my favorite is when like like just this morning i responded to some email from like four months ago where somebody sends me a link to a story right and i'm just like oh i just read that that's really interesting but you know they probably you know they sent it to me four months ago so (laughs) you know like what's going on but anyways four zero someone tell bruce Bruce is the president. Yeah, for non-Iowa people, not Let's some other, not some other random Bruce. Not a random a listener Bruce. right now is like, "Hey, Bruce, four zero. <laughs> <laughs> but with all that said, yes, it has also been a very exciting semester. It has in been. relationship to all of the different interesting and awesome folks that have been coming through Iowa City um, and sharing their their knowledge and just expertise in the field of Latina Latino Latinx studies. And so as much as we're like ah, time, we're also very, very excited mm-hmm. yes. to be welcoming 
um, the next three plenary speakers who will be closing out our fall uh, symposium events. Yep. Yep. And then we'll have just one more event after that in the fall, which will be our, our second film mm-hmm. uh, for which we're bringing in the filmmaker, which is pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have our, our next symposium, which will be Friday, November 8th. Um, and that will hopefully be live streamed. And that will be back at the public library. It'll right? be back at the public library. Pretty excited about being back at the public library. Um, I just really like the space. I like the fact that, you know, for, for our opening conference, we definitely got like walk-ins, right? People mm-hmm. who were just kind of going by, they saw the signs. Um, and I mean, there were a couple of people who like stayed for the day. Like they, they like came in at the end of Friday, were like, whoa, this is cool. And then came in and sat in for the whole day on Saturday. Um, and, you know, with Merge, which is, it, was, it was a wonderful space to use, but it, doesn't have quite that same potential since it is kind of an enclosed space and not the same kind of multi-use space. It created different types of um, opportunities for conversations as well, I would say, because Mm -hmm. Merge, because I think we were off in that space and it didn't allow for so much um, people coming in from the outside that just happened to see the poster. Um, The people that were in the actual uh, conference with us for the day um they they tended to to spend the day listening to what folks had to say and bring in conversations from the first speaker to the second and the third Mm -hmm. um so it just made for different conversations but i i'm looking forward to going back to the library nothing against merge whatsoever it was a wonderful space to use it's just it's just a different it's just a different kind of thing and when when you are when you're putting together programming that you want to have some element of public engagement in it, right? Then using a kind of truly public space like a public library, um, I think just adds that extra dimension that um, that I think also like it just it just helps everyone kind of get in um, in that kind of like connected frame of mind. And then after our next symposium, uh, we've got I think just one more event this calendar year before we we break for uh for the winter break and that's our our second film um at film scene uh the new film scene location at chauncey and um and as i mentioned the the filmmaker Iris morales will be here to do a q a after that film um and she will also be kind of in town visiting classes and meeting with students and I think it's going to be a, a, an excellent opportunity for students at the university to really um, to really learn a lot and and engage someone who um, who has kind of like been involved in so many different aspects of some of the scholarly dimensions of what we're talking about, but really like it was the activism of people like Iris Morales that enabled the emergence of ethnic studies departments, um, you know, Puerto Rican studies in particular, in New York. And so the screening is Palante Siempre Palante, right? Yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the film? Yeah, Palante Siempre Palante is a documentary um, that was um, that was uh, uh, directed by Iris Morales, who's a former member of the Young Lords. Uh, and so it's a, it's a documentary about the emergence of the Young Lords in New York, um, it touches on a host of topics that were significant to their activism, uh, including education, um, uh, kind of women's equality, uh, anti-racism, um, food, clothing, you know, just the, the kind of broad spectrum of kind of what, in, what went into this grassroots street political organization. Um, and it, you know, it, it uses archival footage um, and other archival materials, as well as kind of contemporary for the time the film was produced, contemporary talking head interviews with uh, with former members of the organization. Um, and she really you know, she made a, a concerted effort to really interview as many people as she could on camera um, and to integrate a variety of perspectives um, into the film. Uh, and so it's, I, I, I love the film. It's, uh, you know, I think it was, I think it was, it came out in 1996, if I remember right. Um, and it is, you know, it's just a, it's just a lovely short ish 80 to 90 minutes, 
uh, documentary. Um, and you know, the, the Q and a with her afterward will be great. I've, I've been to events where she's done the Q and a, and she's just such a, she's just such an engaging and inspiring speaker that, uh, I really look forward to the, the, the students at the university of Iowa and other young people from the community having this opportunity to speak with someone who, you know, was really like at the forefront of what at the end of the day was a Latino youth movement. Yeah, so I usually teach the film in my intro to Latina, Latino, Latinx studies course. Um, and it's in the unit where I am talking about student activism, um, both with like the Chicano student movement, but also with the young lords. Um, and I think that it's it's wonderful because students really do see like, oh, people that look like me, youth that were leading these social movements. Yeah. Um, so it's it's also really inspiring, I think. And timely continues to be timely. <laughs> yeah. That's Renee coughing in the background. I too, I, I tried. I, I tried, Daryl. I too will be coughing in the background. It's the weather change. You know, but I feel like this is a running theme because uh, not too long ago, Mine's I was asthma. the one. Yours was some kind of like weird infection. But I'm not coughing like, anymore. Yeah, Look at me. Yeah, 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 or yeah. maybe you got us both sick. No, it would, have, it would have been much worse. Much worse if you all remember me hacking yeah, not too long yeah, ago. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty bad. Yeah. This this is just like allergy, weather change kind of thing for me. Yeah, but I think this is really what Imagining Lean Teens Out is about, right? Colds? I mean, you're talking colds. Well, you know, <laughs> not a adap- very poor adaptation to the cold. Um, but you're talking about this sort of public engagement, like with the public library and getting some um, general audience in addition to the academic audience. And you're talking about a particular sort of type of scholarship that um, I think, you know, really speaks to the type of, of unique perspectives that our program brings to, to the university. And you're talking about this high level of student engagement, bringing her to classes, exposing classes to material, to this sort of firsthand account of material that they're already reading as part of their normal um syllabi you know i think this is really great yeah and you know uh, the the same can be said of of the of the people who were here for our last symposium too i mean all three of the people who we had on campus are in in one way or another actively involved in the kind of like in activism in their community uh and organizing in their communities um from fidencio who uh, when he was in his MFA in the MFA program here at the University of Iowa, was really actively involved with the Center for Workers Justice right. here uh, in Iowa City. Uh, to Karma, who you know continues to be really involved with work, uh, with kind of migrant activism work, um, and to Maura, who uh, is you know I, this didn't come up a ton in the uh, in the in her talk or in the um, or in the podcast last week, but. She's like super involved with what's going on on her campus and with the kind of like, you know, providing resources for students who are really trying to make change on the campus and engaging in that kind of change from uh, in an org- from an organizational perspective, right, of making sure that there is equity between different units um, on her campus. I mean, that's a, you know, it's, that that's an important community where, you know, where we as academics and students spend a significant amount of their time. Uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of work to be done on our college and university campuses. Yep. Especially this one. And so we move from Latina, Latino, Latinx migrations to this next symposium, which is Latina, Latino, Latinx citizenship and national belonging, um, where we were bringing together uh, three um, scholars to talk about the ways that Latina, Latino, Latinx communities are integrated into and respond to dominant U.S. political and cultural social practices. Um, and so who are our speakers that are coming in? So our speakers at this symposium will include three great folks, uh, Suzanne Obler, who is professor of Latin American and Latina Latino studies at John Jay College um, of the City University of New York, um, and is also founding editor of the Latino Studies Journal. Um, the second speaker will be Jillian Baez, who is associate professor of Africana and Puerto Rican slash Latino studies at Hunter College, uh, again, another CUNY school. Uh, And the third speaker is Julie Minich, uh, who is associate professor in the departments of English 
and Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. So three great speakers who once again really kind of tap into that uh, that kind of core sense of interdisciplinarity that we've been wanting to tap into for each of our symposia. So um, I think Obeler has a bit more of a social scientific background. Uh, Minich is definitely kind of squarely within the humanities. Uh, and then Baez really, I think, kind of straddles both worlds. Um, her work is, is I think, just as strongly influenced by like critical and cultural studies as it is by uh, qualitative social scientific uh a really rigorous qualitative social scientific research. And it's a really good thematic follow-up from migration, right? If you think about the migration conference and we're talking about, you know, we have like, again, Fidencio, who's a former DACA recipient, is spending a lot of time thinking about the types of, you know, citizenship, right, as a, in, in a narrow sense, but in a, in, a, in a larger, you know, sense too, as we'll get into when we talk about some of the Opler stuff, right? Um, you know, even going back to some of Karma's work, right? And thinking about the extent to which we integrate or alienate uh, immigrant populations when she was talking about rhetoric. And that all sort of, again, gets at these ideas of, of incorporation and belonging and citizenship. I feel like it was a really natural um, intellectual segue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we might as well start by talking about Obeler's work. I mean, in part because when I think of, you know, the connection between Latino studies and citizenship, Obler is the kind of first person to come to mind for me. And maybe that's just because like her edited book, Latinos and Citizenship, colon, The Dilemmas of Belonging. Uh, and that's a, a 2006 book, um, which is, uh, you know, which is really just kind of a, I mean, I just think of it as just such a foundational book mm -hmm. um, that if you, and, and really like if you look at the work on Latinos and Citizenship, published after that point, Obler has to be cited, right? Um, what do you think are some of the, the like key qualities of her work on citizenship that have made it have such a kind of lasting impact? So when I think about Suzanne Obler's work um, and really centering Latinidad, when we're having these conversations around citizenship, um, it really brings up these notions of how it changes meanings of citizenship, right? Um, so we we tend to think about citizenship as just centered around legality, um, when in fact there's so many different factors that come into play, right? And so to think about Obler's contributions is to also also think about citizenship as meaning cultural citizenship, social practices um, that either include Latinos at the forefront or exclude them in various ways yeah and you know like so um you know we just actually got together this morning for the listener and had a sort of working group discussion about some of this material and those are extremely useful conversations for me to have because they are help uh, they're really helping to educate me i've mentioned in a previous uh conversation podcast we've had the extent to which um you just sort of our intellectual union has really educated me uh and is continuing to sort of expand my horizons on Latino studies and the applications of Latino studies to my work as a social scientist. And this was one of those very typical conversations where I was engaging this work in a way that I had not, you know, honestly uh, really engaged it beforehand. And we're thinking about these concepts of what citizenship means. And my impulse is to think about it in that narrower, very political way. I mean, I'm a political scientist. Of course, I'm going to think about sort of very explicit political activities, right? And now sort of pushing it and thinking about citizenship, a very political word, and thinking about it within a with a social or cultural meaning, sort of forcing me to expand sort of what basically counts as citizenship and therefore we're like yeah. what should what subjects, what kind of things should people in my discipline be paying attention to? You know, what are the effects of these social and cultural experiences and therefore how do those social and cultural experiences not just like that there's a that there's a difference between um these sort of like legal and and cultural types of citizenship but also that uh it's you know we're talking a little bit about distinction but there's some sort of spillover and connection right and the implication is that there's some kind of relationship between this uh, social cultural citizenship and these legal types of citizenship. And so the extent to which we're ignoring that in my field means we're ignoring things that are determining 
the stuff we really care about, right? If we really care about the, these legal, this legal understanding of citizenship, but we're ignoring the cultural and the social aspects of it, then we're having a really imperfect and incomplete understanding, right? So it was a really useful conversation for me this yeah. morning. Yeah. Obler's position really, you know, together with a, with a few other, with a couple other uh, uh, scholars who did early work on this, like Renato Rosaldo, um, uh, their work on cultural citizenship and educational democracy, that's the title of the essay, um, along with uh, Flores and Ben um edited volume, Latino Cultural Citizenship, Claiming Identity, Space, and Rights. Uh, both of those are from the, the 1990s, but it's, it's that in combination with, uh, with Obler's work that really like defines that terrain of citizenship within Latino studies, especially that uh, that that kind of gets us to look beyond those legal structures and to start asking questions about the ways in which people really imagine themselves as belonging to um, a national community that um, that you know even when they have kind of quote unquote full legal citizenship uh, still seeks modes of exclusion and enforces these different practices of exclusion exclusion on them. Well, because part of what we're also getting at is we're thinking about the citizenship in term citizenship in terms of um, the ways in which Latinos are are reimagining it and navigating it, but also um, the other side what citizenship assumes, which is a, a type of assimilation, right? Um, Obler and quite of the other of the folks that you mentioned um, at one point are responding to the work of um, Huntington and, you know, oh, yeah. how Latinos... Who, who is a political scientist, right? Right. But it is that, that fear, that threat of um, what citizenship means in terms of, like, American citizenship um, as this, like... Um, That's an awesome book. Yeah, is like, it? Like, my, my, my favorite... <laughs> Part of the book is when we are, he argues that we're not a nation of immigrants, right? Because there's, there are immigrants and there are settlers. Mm. And, you know, the original sort of white Protestant immigrants were, I mean, they were, they, they were settlers. They were founding a sort of national identity. And therefore, it's incumbent upon all future immigrants to, as you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, assimilate and incorporate into that identity which the settlers established right and and that's the the word that was escaping me like that incorporation right that latinos cannot uh, incorporate yeah. into an american identity yeah i mean it's funny it's, it's funny you use you use, you bring up that word it makes me think about um work that i'm that i'm kind of doing that's supposed to be my next book and someday it will actually get done uh but it's on um on puerto rico and the way that uh that puerto rico was kind of taken as a possession of the united states and in those early congressional debates over puerto rico status um it's that uh that question of incorporation uh is raised and this is where we get in the supreme court rulings in the in the insular cases particularly Downs versus Bidwell uh in 1901 for those of you following along at home uh this idea that Puerto Rico um and other territories acquired via the Spanish American War are unincorporated territories that and I'm quoting right belong to but are not part of the united states and to see that reasoning this is you know, before the court case of course but to see that reasoning worked out out loud by someone like um, albert beveridge who was a senator from indiana uh, a kind of darling of the republican party at the time uh, and really had quickly become known as the orator of imperialism uh, you know he wanted puerto rico to be uh, to be possessed by the united states but one of his great his fears was that the United States would then become possessed by Puerto Rico in a kind of like a, a haunting sort of way, but really like that our blood would be, you know, would be poisoned mm -hmm. by these, you know, these savage Puerto Ricans, right? And this is the kind of language he uses. Mm -hmm. or, you know, not, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm essentially quoting. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so so yeah, the, the way that citizenship cuts in kind of multiple directions, um, and you know that we we do kind of have to like like the the legal questions, right, and like the formal political questions are important, and so are these questions of how this gets kind of like talked about and symbolized and practiced. 
um, outside of those specific legal uh, and formal, you know, juridical power structures. So what's really interesting is, like, like we just said, Huntington's a political scientist, right? And obviously, there is a huge backlash um, amongst within my field, you know, uh, written by many of my friends and colleagues uh, towards the book. But the backlash wasn't really along the lines of what you guys are saying, right? The, the backlash wasn't saying that, well, it's not that Latinos basically, you know, his argument is that they're, they're, they're not assimilating, right? And, and the argument wasn't, well, they shouldn't have to assimilate, that, you know, a true sort of cultural citizenship would allow them to continue to express their Latino heritage and identity strongly and still, like, that should still be part of America. Uh, it was actually sort of more of an empirical sociological argument that assimilation is actually happening at a pretty uh. steady clip, which is, you know, like, empirically true, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Like, assimilation does happen at a steady clip, right? But it wasn't, but that was that was the, that was the uh, retort, right? Which is very, very different than types of yeah. retorts you guys, you know, w- uh, would make, right? So rather than saying, hey, this is a pro-settler colonialism, really fundamentally racist argument, the argument was... No, no, no! You're wrong on the empirical facts. Assimilation <laughs> is happening right now. Yes, yes, yes. Pretend the racism thing didn't happen. Uh, Yay, white discipline! Yeah, yeah. But there are these historical moments, as is brought up, both like historically in relationship to talking about Puerto Rico and the United States, as well as within disciplines in bringing up Huntington and political science, um, where these questions of citizenship uh, arise. And so within Obler's work, for example, she motions towards 9-11 as this Uh moment um, where we see these practices of racism um, come up uh, again in very violent, direct ways. I would say, given our current political moment, um, this is one of those those periods as well. Whatever, whatever would you mean, <laughs> Nadia? Right? Let's look at the World Series <laughs> and see what reactions folks had to, to visitors about. in the audience. It's not, you're going to give Renee a bunch of cognitive dissonance again. I know. I'm like, but I like hearing him talk about. <laughs> about what? I don't about know what his, you're talking about. His, his love World of, Series never of happened. Baseball. Never happened. <laughs> um but yeah so it, i think it's it'll be really interesting to hear her um revisit a lot of these conversations as well as push them in different directions yeah um for the symposium yeah and someone whose work uh is really kind of like i think explicitly indebted to uh to to some of these foundational arguments uh pushing citizenship out of that legal that ex- that's that narrowly legal realm is Jillian Baez who's just uh, I can't say enough good things about her book in search of belonging, uh, which I just had some of my students read uh, read part of um, uh, yesterday. Uh, but you know Bias's work is is really fantastic because I think it it taps into exactly what Renee was talking about a minute ago, which is that um, that it's not really an either or when we're talking about citizenship. We have to be kind of cognizant of uh, these varied dimensions of citizenship and the ways that citizenship can be understood, can be uh, can be kind of meaningful uh, in an a priori manner, uh, and can be made meaningful by the people who are engaging uh, its kind of callings. Uh, and so, you know, w- when we talk about citizenship, in other words, we have to be attentive to uh, the ways in which you know there is a kind of like strong, uh, clear material dimension to citizenship, um, and then you know Baez contrasts that not contrast contrast is the wrong word but pairs that with what she calls the symbolic dimension of citizenship or kind of symbolic form of citizenship. So it's not a is citizenship you know legal or is it cultural. Uh, her answer is, well, citizenship is both material and symbolic, uh, and we have to be attentive to the different dimensions of those because for some people, uh, citizenship is really like you know most significantly and most present as this material thing. If you are undocumented in the United States, uh, there is a strong material sense of citizenship that structures your relationship to that term um, that might create forms of, you know, of, of kind of longing, right, for, uh, for inclusion in that. Uh, it might create other forms of kind of uh, uh, dissonance um, and be the source of fear. 
Uh, and, you know, but if you are, you know, if you are formally, materially a citizen, uh, that doesn't like, that doesn't eliminate the need to ask questions about citizenship and belonging and how that structures one's feelings of their place within this country, for example. And so when we're thinking about Again, where the where citizenship is enacted, one place for Jillian Baez is um, particularly the media. So she's thinking about these relationships between the media culture and citizenship um, among um, Latina audience, Latina Latino audiences. Um, and so in that case, really thinking about the ways in which cultural citizenship are enacted in everyday life Um I think it's interesting to also consider the way that we have um, our now later symposium panelists, speakers um, in conversation with folks that have come through at the beginning of the semester, in uh-huh. particular Aline Davila, right? Yeah, sure. Um, who's thinking about um, Latina, Latino, Latinx consumers. Um, and so Jillian is very much in conversation with her and thinking about that movement from consumer to a public and how it is that they interact and engage um, with with media representations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that there that some people so in my experience as a as a communication studies professor uh I think there are a lot of people who want to just kind of like dismiss the significance or importance of uh mediated representations right I mean the retort that I that I hear uh and that I see in people's eyes in a large lecture class sometimes is Oh my gosh, get over yourself. It's just a movie or it's just a TV show or it's just a advertisement. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, the Bias's work really helps to establish, right, through this like really in depth field work that she did, as well as the kinds of focus groups and stuff that she's done, um, is to like to like demonstrate to evidence, to provide data for uh, the the idea that you know, that these representations like have significance for people, um, whether you, you know, whether it does for, for you, right. is kind of like besides the point perhaps. Um, and this is really, you know, I, I saw this in person in my class yesterday when I, and, you know, when I, when I asked them to get into groups and to kind of discuss Baez's argument about citizenship and mediation, uh, and to think back in their own lives, right, about when they saw something on television um, that that really helped to kind of like speak to the core issues of belonging that Baez is, is talking about. And they, 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 of course, pulled examples that I'm just totally unfamiliar with because I'm old. <laughs> um, and, you know, they were watching, they were starting to watch television at a time when I really wasn't watching certainly, you know, children's and young adult television. Um, and so they're pulling from programs that I've never heard of and, and pulling out great clips uh, from YouTube to share with the class that are like, wow. So here, you know, uh, one of them was uh, Cheetah. Cheetah Girls? Cheetah Girls. Yeah. Never heard of it before. You're like, Cheetah Girls. Yeah. Um, oh, my gosh. I have their posters <laughs> up on my wall. <laughs> no. <laughs> but but they, they grabbed this great, this great clip from Cheetah Girls um, uh, of, you know, two of the characters kind of, you know, speaking to each other uh, and like using Spanglish. Right. And this is, a Dis- I believe, a Disney uh, uh, series of movies. Uh, and, you know, they talked about how seeing that on screen right, is, was unique, right, and showed that, and showed them, right, that what they experienced in their everyday lives, right, which is that kind of casual use of Spanglish, is not something that is other. It is something that people do, right, and that it's not, it doesn't have to be a point of exclusion, that it can be a kind of, like, point of belonging. Um, And Mm -hmm. that's like, you know, people make sense out of their media consumption, um, and really like this stuff becomes incredibly meaningful for people, right? I mean, that's a, it's, it's not a, that's not a recent show, but that's a, it's a scene that stood out to students in my class from, you know, from their youth. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were able to find it and, and share it with us and have a discussion about it. And I think that's fantastic. And you can think about the significance of these representations, not only in, you know, media from from folks youth, but also uh, more recent representations. Right. Oh, so yeah, here absolutely. I'm thinking of like Miles Morales and the Spider-Man. Um, yeah. Latest whatever cartoon. I, I can't remember the title of it. 
the Spider Man universe something. Spider Verse. Spider Verse. Look at see you do Spider-verse. know you do know stuff about pop yeah, culture. Yeah, yeah. Here you are pretending yeah. you don't wow. know yeah. things. I've seen that movie. Not La you Bamba, have you? but I've seen Spider Verse. Yeah. Okay, but see that moment where they're speaking Spanglish. You it, it, to me seemed so um, organic yeah. and not forced, and yeah. it was like I thought it was beautiful. I'm like, wow. Yeah. I'm a Latino in New York and just like, see, mommy, ya yeah, boy. Like, it, it was awesome. I still haven't seen the, that that full movie, but I started watching it when, like, s- my son CJ had, like, a couple, who's three years old, had a couple of his three year old friends over. Um, and we needed to take a break and, like, watch a movie and have some popcorn. Uh, and one of the kids wanted to uh, to watch that, like a like a young, you know, Iowa white kid uh, loves that movie. Mm. Uh, and so, we're like, oh, this is. This is great. I mean, this becomes a right. Yeah. So this this helps to kind of like normalize exactly, right exactly. for broader audiences. Um, we stopped watching it in part because it's like, oh, this is maybe a little bit violent for a three year old. We may have watched it in my household with a three year old. So. I, I, I want I want to finish watching it on my own to like okay. be sure. Uh, you know, CJ. Yeah, he he gets he he ends up getting nightmares. Uh, so he ends up getting nightmares. I'm surprised. Yesterday was Halloween. Nico was like, "Oh, what is that? It clown guy." I'm really Ugh. curious about. It. I was just like, "You're not freaking out." Stay like, no, stay away no. from the sword brain, Nico. <laughs> stay away. I was like, "All right, dude, that's on you." Speaking of Spider Man, Renee had to leave just now, so it is just me and Adiana, which means also we can use the sad trombone noise. Yay. I feel like we can kind of make that Renee's sound. If I'm not around for one of the podcast recordings, I kind of want a, my own. You want your little... own unique sound? Yeah. What would it be? Because you did miss that one and I used the sad you trombone. You used the sad trombone, but really that's why you. I feel like I'm like, that sad trombone isn't me. That's, that's really Renee. I mean, do you... <laughs> So what, in your absence, do you want like the opposite of sand tr- sad trombone, like Spanish fly? Maybe, maybe something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? Yes. That's a, that's kind of a la- like set the, the and just cut it off. Oh, just the, just the, just the <laughs> right. first few notes of it. Exactly. Make mm. it happen. Make it happen for the next time I'm not around. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll I'll, I'll search I'll search my sound library and because see then if we just don't else. even have to say like Renee's in here. We'll just go wah, wah, wah. and here's Daryl and Adriana talking about. <laughs> oh, so so we could, so we right. like edit it out of the intro too. Exactly. Oh, interesting. So what? So it's like you know. I'm, Hi, I'm Daryl Wanzer. I don't know. I'm Adriana Ruiz, and, and I'm wah, 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 wah. Wah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, with that, uh, we we still have one more. We still have one more excellent speaker to uh, to talk about. Yes, definitely not a sad trombone sound no, for this. No, not at all. Um, and that's uh, that's Julie Minich, uh, whose talk is going to be titled "Sugar Shame Love: Colon Diabetes, Latinx Literature, and Health Justice." Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk in part because uh, I have a I have. Students in my department who are studying sugar. Mm. I have other students in my department who study health and citizenship, um, and others who are uh, students and faculty who are uh, who are pretty animated by disability studies. And she's just really awesome and incredible. I think she brings in um, a whole different realm of conversations to um, the things that we've already been discussing within the various symposiums and opening conference. So she teaches, as you mentioned earlier, um, at the University of Texas at Austin, where she's teaching courses in Latinx literary and cultural studies, gender and sexuality studies, and disability studies. Um, And I think especially that emphasis on disability studies within her research is what makes it so unique, but also so necessary to these conversations on citizenship um, that we've been discussing. Uh, So the book that uh, she wrote in 2013 or no, I believe it's 2014, um, is Accessible Citizenships, Disability, Nation, and the Cultural Politics of Greater Mexico. And within that text, she's really thinking about um, political belonging and how we're talking about it in relationship to um, nationalism and the state. And I, I really like, I mean, if I could just like read from the first sentence of her abstract for her talk um, on November 8th, 
She says, this talk examines health status as a technology for the regulation of national belonging alongside Latinx visions of health justice. And I love the idea of health status as a technology for the regulation of national belonging, Mm -hmm. um, in part because I think it really... Uh, shows the kind of, I think it alludes to the discursive force of these broader questions and rhetorics of health uh, and how those play into who can belong or who is deemed worthy of belonging yes. and not and not worthy of belonging. And I also find really interesting, and this is the, the English, you know, literary nerd in me, um, that she is turning to literature as the site for health research, right? Um, because it, it does offer this opportunity to really think about um, the health of individuals as directly tied to structural formation um, of their societies. And in this case of, again, nationalism and citizenship. And so to really to think about literature as the site for these conversations to take place, um, I find really engaging. Um, And so she's really thinking about this idea of how um, figures, but also writers are, are experiencing um, these questions around health, right? Especially when we think about health around this idea of personal choices, um, because it, it, it's it's quite the opposite of that. And so she's really thinking about, you know, communities of color um, where there are these just disproportionate uh, number of of folks that are suffering from obesity, asthma, diabetes, sexually transmitted infections, addiction, um, high risk or stigmatized pregnancies, mental illness, all of these different things that we we don't often both things that we can readily come to mind when we're thinking about disability studies, but also things like mental health um, that aren't always discussed. Yeah. And that, and that, and that all have a kind of like structural dimension that goes beyond individual choice, right? Like the things that you list off um, and, 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 you know, and she talks about, uh, she kind of lists off a bunch of, uh, a bunch of similar things in her abstract for her talk. These are things that, uh, that occur at a higher rate within communities of color, uh, and in particular, you know, when, when she's focusing on diabetes, which is going to be the the, the main focus of this talk, uh, you know, there's a strong disproportionate um, effect in uh, Latinx communities and in African American communities um, due to a whole history of kind of medical neglect and environmental factors and a host of other things that are that are that truly are beyond an individual's control uh, and so to to kind of like zero in on that stuff uh, puts her really squarely at the nexus of health studies disability studies critical race studies uh, and to do all that in the context of citizenship um, I, I greatly look forward to the the the, the kind of like points of analysis that she's going to be able to develop for us. Yeah, it'll be an interesting conversation. Um, both, I mean, all of the, our whole uh, list of speakers, um, both individually, but also thinking about how they're going to be in conversation with one another. Yeah, I really look forward to, to, to that. And I think, um, <clears throat> and you're going to be doing the uh, the roundtable discussion afterward, aren't you? Yes, I will. So um, I'll be, I'll definitely uh be sure to to ask about some of those conversations that they've see amongst each other um, as they're listening to to their presentations. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Um, so again, this symposium is uh, is on Friday, November eighth. Uh, it kicks off at nine o'clock in the morning with some uh, some pastries and coffee and tea, uh, with the first speaker going at nine thirty a.m. Uh, and the whole thing lasts through 4.30 p.m. Uh, on the same day. Uh, the location will be the Iowa City Public Library. Uh, and as always, uh, all, of our, all of our events are free and open to the public. Yep. And again, that's the final symposium for this semester. Um, and after that, we'll also have the film screening um, with Edie's, what's the date? Uh, the film screening will be on Wednesday, December 4th at 5.30 p.m. at Film Scene Chauncey. Okay. Downtown Iowa City. Awesome. 
So yeah, we'll talk more about the film in. Uh, I think we'll, I think we'll be able to talk more about the film in a future episode. Although the exact schedule of episodes is uh, eluding me right now. Um, but if we don't, please be sure to check our social media channels. So for the uh, for for the Imagining Latinidades programming in general, not just the podcast, uh, you can find us at uh, at U Iowa L A T S. University of Iowa Latino Studies, uh, U Iowa Lats uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but especially um, Facebook and Twitter. Well, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the day of the symposium um, to kind of follow along and hear what you know folks are thinking about or um, images from the symposium itself, um, be sure to also uh, follow the tag uh, hashtag Imagining Lat. Yep. Um, there's yeah. been pictures and conversations happening and, yeah. and all of that great stuff. Yeah, we're pretty active on Twitter the day of uh, the day of the events. And we should have we'll have a, a link posted uh, at the top of our Facebook page. So pinned to the top of our Facebook page and pinned to the top of our of our Twitter page that will have a link to the live stream, which hopefully will work this time. Uh, it didn't work last time. Okay, we had so that, that needs a sad trombone too. Okay. Yeah. And it now moves beyond Rene. I see. I see how <laughs> it functions. Um, yeah. So with that said, um, we're really looking forward to the symposium. Um, and we hope that you've um enjoyed our our intro to that event. Um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on the podcast, um, on the symposium or on anything really, uh, on Twitter at Imagining Lat. Shoot us an email at podcast at imagining latinidades dot com. Uh, please, please, please share this podcast with friends and give us five stars at Apple Podcast. Those ratings help expose us to more people and give us a fighting chance of making it onto one of those curated lists um, that are, you know, like new and noteworthy things of that kind. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. Check the show notes for all the links and sites that we mentioned today. Um, wishing you a happy sort of mid-semester for those of you that are trudging along and we will be back soon yeah we'll be back soon i think the next episode will be the roundtable discussion from the symposium uh, that'll occur later this week thanks